Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll wait maybe a minute or so for, for listeners to join. Um, Good evening for those that are joining. We are just uh, taking some time to let everyone else join in. Good evening. Maybe one more minute, and then we'll just see if anyone's in late. <laughs> Good evening, those who are joining. Just, just take a few more moments. Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, viewers will join us. Audience attendees will come in as they wish. Swiss. So, hello and welcome to everyone joining us um, for another live stream talk. We have a special guest presenter who I'll introduce in a moment. I am Valenza from Sun Talk. We are a charity based in South London, which aims to provide better social and emotional health outcomes for children with special educational needs and their families. If you're joining us live, feel free to add your questions into the chat on the screen. We will try to respond to as many as we have the chance to um, after our presentation today. If you're watching the YouTube recording, please add your comments and questions and continue the discussion. With that said, I'm delighted to be joined with Nicola Johns. She she is a passionate children's occupational therapist in Wimbledon Park and working within Southwest London. Nicola has studied her master's in occupational therapy in Australia and has worked with children with a range of challenges in London since 2009. She is an advanced sensory integration practitioner and has postgraduate training in developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia, handwriting interventions, visual stress, sound-based therapy, and Makaton signing. Nicola has experience using a range of assessment and treatment strategies with children with sensory processing difficulties, ASD, ADHD, dyspraxia, or DCD, dyslexia, developmental delay, and social communication difficulties. She specializes in assessing and treating children with sensory processing, attention, coordination, postural, and handwriting difficulties to help them reach their full potential. With that said, today's presentation will center on eating and feeding difficulties and useful support strategies we might use. Nicola, welcome. You have the floor now, so I will put up your presentation. Brilliant, thank you, Belenza. We, we can see your presentation, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Brilliant, great. Thank you, Valenza, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today's talk, um, Sen Talk asked me to talk on this topic as I think there have been a few requests from some of the parents who were struggling with some feeding and eating difficulties with their children. So it will be a general OT-based talk discussing the difficulties that you might um, be noticing and some strategies that that might help. Just to say this, I'm not going to go into specifics of really complex feeding difficulties because for this, firstly, we'd need a very long talk and I wouldn't be able to cover everything. But secondly, um, 
these kind of complex eating eating disorders and things should be seen by a specialist feeding team. But I'm really hoping that looking broadly at a whole range of factors and strategies will give each of you a couple of tips to take to take home, and there'll be different things that um, that will that will jump out to jump out to each of you. So just note down anything that that might be of interest. Okay. So our aims for the talk today are to talk about what feeding and eating issues are. These words can be used interchangeably, but they often use feeding to describe difficulties for infants and children and then eating difficulties or disorders for um, teens, adolescents and adults. We'll talk about the factors that might lead to these issues. We'll talk through a range of strategies you can try at home. I will point you in the direction of where you can get a bit of further help or information, because there might be things that have triggered some ideas from this talk. And then at the end, we will have some time for questions and answers. So as Valenza said, please do put your questions into the chat box. So we're going to start with why don't some children eat well? Why do they find eating so difficult? So importantly, eating is actually not that easy. It's a really complex process. There's 25 to 32 steps that they have to, that everyone has to go through before the food even gets to your mouth. Eating involves all of our organs all of our senses and there are so many different muscles involved so it is really complex and any difficulties at any of these stages can easily cause cause barriers sometimes underlying diagnoses or difficulties can have an impact on eating um, so it's commonly seen with children with autism spectrum disorders about 67 percent of them might be picky eaters 90 percent of children with ASD will have sensory processing difficulties. Many children will have sensory processing difficulties as a, as a standalone difficulty, and that's gonna cause a lot of issues with your eating. Um, and also just typically developing children are gonna have difficult, difficulty eating. Some of the research says about 20 to 45% of typically developing children might have difficulty feeding at some time. It's important to say that behaviours such as refusing new foods are, norm, are a normal stage of a child's development. So just because your infant, toddler, child, teen is refusing foods sometimes does not mean that they necessarily have a feeding difficulty or, or an eating disorder. It's really normal to go through this. Um, it's more just working out when actually this has become a bigger problem than would be expected. The kinds of things that your child might be experiencing or reasons that might have brought you to come and listen to this talk would be seeing picky or selective eating. Your child might be struggling with textures, tastes or smells of food. They might struggle with their independence with eating, independence with using cutlery, with finger feeding, with you know even emotional independence, things like that. They might not know when they're hungry or full or thirsty. They might have difficulty sitting at the table for meal times or not sitting for very long when they do sit. They might show other negative behaviours at meal times, like running off or throwing food or tantrums. Or they might show behaviours like choking, gagging or vomiting, which can make meal times really distressing. So firstly, it's important to distinguish between the difference between picky eaters and problem feeders. So as I said, many children can be picky eaters. Um, they will eat, the picky eaters will eat a decreased range of food, but they will eat more than 30 different types of food. And sometimes you need to look at the different specific types of food they're eating. You might think your child doesn't eat that, but actually when you sit down with a list or you can get feeding checklists off the internet or from therapists as well, you might be surprised to know that actually you're ticking more boxes than you think than you think you are because they're eating a range of different types of food in those categories. So picky eaters, they tolerate new food on their plate and they might touch or taste it. If they stop eating a particular food, they may be able to eat it again after a couple of weeks. And they eat at least one food from each texture group. So they'll eat at least one wet food, at least one dry food, and they'll eat 
at least one from the nutritional group. So at least one carbohydrate, at least one protein, at least one fruit and vegetable. And they learn how to eat food quicker than problem feeders. And they generally can eat with their family or their peers. Not all the time, but they can. When we look alternatively at problem feeders, they are much more restricted in the range and variety of their foods and they're eating less than 20 foods. And this shows us that they might have a major difficulty. If they do stop eating a particular food, they won't be able to pick it up again after a period of time. You can see lots of emotional difficulties like crying, upset, refusing, and they might refuse an entire category of textures and never eat wet or dry or mixed textures or not eat a single protein or fruit. It takes them a long time to add new foods to their diet and they're often eating alone or eating a separate meal to everyone else in the family. So if you think your child is a picky eater, then there'll be lots of tips in this talk of what you can try and do um, at home by yourself. If you think that it's actually got to the point of a problem feed and you haven't had any professional intervention, there are places you can go. And this gives you a bit of an indication of how severe the difficulty might be and whether you do need that professional help. So there are many factors that can lead to feeding issues. As I said, I'm going to broadly touch on a range of topics because it is such a big topic um, and talk about the main factors that I think can lead to feeding issues. However, there obviously are more than just these ones I'm talking about. So if you look at the picture here of an iceberg, when you're in the sea, all you can see is the tip of that iceberg. And that tip of that iceberg with the feeding difficulty, you're seeing behaviors like refusal to eat or throwing food on the floor or won't sit still or won't come to the table to eat. You're seeing them restricting their diet or struggling with their cutlery or struggling to self-feed. And it's quite hard to, to look at anything else other than just those behaviors that you see. And eating is quite an emotional thing and it does involve many hours of your life at home and at school. Um, so it's, it's, sometimes it's quite hard to see out of it and actually realize there's so much going on under that iceberg and we need to look at what else is going on underneath, what else could be affecting their feeding. So we're gonna talk about each of these factors one at a time, we're gonna talk about sensory processing, physical factors, cognitive or psychological factors, self-regulation difficulties, and then a range of other factors that might impact on their feeding difficulties. So we're gonna start with the sensory issues because this is often a huge factor, um, especially for children with um, sensory difficulties or with a range of other diagnoses. It's gonna really affect um, how well they start eating and how their eating trajectory goes. So going back to a little bit of science in terms of sensory processing, for those of you who need a recap or some of you who might not have heard much about sensory processing before, we actually have seven senses, not just the five that we learn at school. So we've got our sense of touch, our sense of sight, our sense of hearing, our sense of smell, and our sense of taste. Those are the five that we're all familiar with. We also have our vestibular sense, which is our sense of movement and balance, and it tells us where our head is in space. It's our relationship with gravity. It feeds into how balanced we are, into our upright posture, and into our coordination as well. And then our proprioception is our sense of muscles and joints. So it tells us how our body is positioned, it feeds back about our body awareness, how our muscles are moving, how heavy our pressure is when we're doing activities, um, and that is a huge underpinning for coordination. So the brain needs to register that all these seven senses, orientate to where the information is coming from, filter out what's not important and keep what is important. So filtering out all the background noise, filtering out 
at the temperature of the room and any background smells, things like that. Organize a response and then respond appropriately. And your brain is doing this every minute of the day. And if there's any breakdown in how these senses are integrated, it can cause difficulties for emotional regulation, for sensory regulation, um, and for, for coordination and hospital control as well. So when we think of this in relating to feeding, we need to consider all the senses. We need to think about all those seven senses because they are all involved in how we eat. So we need to understand our child's sensory preferences. So think about the sense of touch. How do those foods, especially the ones they hate, how does that feel in their hands? You know, do you really want to touch it or are you mainly serving with, with a spoon or something and then expecting them to eat it with their hands? How does it feel with their hands? Are they really sensitive? Are they tactile defensive? How does that food feel in their mouth in terms of texture, in terms of temperature, and in terms of taste? Some children might be underreactive within their tactile sense, and they won't necessarily be able to register or understand or make sense of feeling of, of the touch of things. So they might not know where that food is in their mouth. They might not have very good tactile awareness in their tongue, in their mouth, and their palate in which case they don't know where the food is. They don't really know how to create that bolus to be able to swallow it. They might have had experiences in the past of choking um, or swallowing something too big because they didn't know, and then that causes the negative reaction that affects their feeding in the future. So again, with sensory issues, we need to think about the temperature of the food. We need to think about visual aspects, so the color, shape, how is it visually presented, does it look the same today as it looked yesterday? Or does it look totally different? Think of the sounds. So sa the sound of chewing, sound of crunching, is that really overwhelming for some children? And then proprioceptive feedback is a really big one as well. Again, the awareness of where their tongue is, awareness of how their jaw is moving can be a huge one for children not feeling very confident or in control of how their feeding is going. Or sometimes you get an overstuffing mouth. So children will put lots of food in their mouth and they'll keep stuff in their mouth and they'll keep all, all stuffed out. And that might be a sign of proprioceptive feedback because they're not getting enough feedback from their cheeks, from their, in, their inner mouth to know when they've had enough. And therefore they're overstuffing to get that feedback and that makes them feel good. And then movement, our vestibular sense. So is there lots of movement around them? How is their seating? Are they seated nice and stable? And how is their posture? Are their legs on the floor? If their legs aren't on their floor, they might feel unstable. They might not feel like they've got a, they're grounded. They don't have a good relationship with gravity. That might make them feel a bit nervous. Again, children with severe vestibular difficulties might really struggle with their head movements. So tilting their head back to be able to have a drink might feel like quite a worrying, anxiety-provoking experience. We also need to think about the sensory issues with the environment. Consider the noise in the environment, which could be just coming from the cutlery on the plate, or could be coming from people talking around them. Or at school or out and about in the community, it could be really overstimulating, loud, noisy um, canteens could be really distracting, really busy, which stops them from eating, or, or sensory overload because all their senses are being overloaded um, by the environment. And then some people call it the eighth sense, and some people say actually interoception is a combination of the other senses. It's actually your internal proprioception and your internal tactile awareness. And this is our internal sense of things like when we are hungry, full, or thirsty. So your interoception is all of your internal senses. So it also tells you how fast your heart is beating. It tells you how your breathing is. It tells you whether your bladder is full or not. It tells you whether you're sweating, whether you're hot, whether you're cold, whether you're tired, whether your muscles are tired, fatigued, or full of energy. There's so many different aspects to interoception. It's a really big field. 
Um, but children with sensory processing difficulties will often have difficulties with their interoception. And that might lead to a child not eating enough because they don't know their hunger signs, they don't feel them, or overeating because they don't know when they're full. And then that can lead to other issues as well. So those are the sensory factors that might affect feeding. Physical and functional factors are things like posture and seating. So we'll talk a bit more about that later, but making, but if a child isn't seated well and doesn't have the appropriate posture, eating is gonna be much harder. Again, considering the environment, we've talked about the sensory environment, but it's also important to consider the social environment, um, the emotional environment, just, you know, is the environment the same or different from other experiences they've had? Consider cutlery. Do they have dyspraxia or bilateral coordination difficulties or weak hands or muscles? And actually using cutlery is physically really hard for them, which then creates negativity around mealtimes. Has their suck, swallow and breathe um, mechanism been developed properly? So um, children who might have been premature or had difficulties um, in utero or in, in early childhood might have difficulties in these areas and that's when you would need more specialist input from an OT or a speech and language therapist. Do they have the oromotor skills? Do they, are they able to seal their lips? Are they able to chew? Are they able to form a bolus and be able to swallow it down? Are they able to do all of those stages of swallowing, which goes from your oral stage to your pharyngeal stage to your esophageal stage and issues can happen at all those points? And do they have a history of vomiting or a reflux or of choking? And when children have had these kind of issues, then if they go on, they can have more negative experiences and that can really cause emotional issues related to eating. You also have to be aware of things like silent aspiration. So when we aspirate and our food goes down the wrong, the wrong hole, generally you'll start to cough and your eyes will water and you try and get it out. Babies and infants sometimes do this silently where actually they won't cough, so we won't even know that it's gone down the wrong way. Um, but it can have a really big impact on them um, medically, and they really need to be assessed by a doctor, just for you to be aware of. Other issues, which I'm sure many of you can relate to, are their thinking style. So Inflexibility, rigidity, and reduced tolerance for uncertainty are big issues, especially for children with ASD, but can be for a range of children who might have anxiety and feel like they need to be in control of things. So children who don't like uncertainty or change. So they like to have the same food in the same place, in the same location. They need to see the packaging because they're very specific that they only eat this type of cracker or this type of crisp. They might be quite rigid in terms of what food that they, they have or which cup they sip from or which plate they eat from or what colour that is. And they may need to feel that they need to that they want to control all of these aspects and they really struggle when they're not in control of it. It's important to think about food that is really consistent and is very um, certain for, for children. So food like especially fruit and vegetables and homemade food is actually very inconsistent. Think about a blueberry. Sometimes blueberries are sweet, sometimes they're a little bit sour. Sometimes they're hard and they you have to press quite you have to bite quite hard until they burst and sometimes they're a bit mushy. That is going to cause issues for a child who does not like change and is rigid and a blueberry is just never the same and that's one of the reasons they might avoid them and think about that when you think about lots of different fruit and vegetables and um, other more more natural foods whereas a cracker or food out of a packet is exactly the same every single time so no wonder they find it easier another factor is self-regulation just to think about how much sleep have they had do they have sleeping issues? And therefore, no wonder they're going to find just being emotionally and physically ready for things like, for challenging experiences like trying new food is going to um, cause issues for them. Do they have emotional difficulties anyway? Do they struggle to regulate their emotions? Are they naturally an anxious child or adolescent? In which case, 
introducing change and new foods is going to um, be harder for them? And have they had continuous negative experiences? So have they had a childhood where they've continuously been forced to eat certain foods and this has caused a lot of negative reactions? Or experiences where it's always stressful around meal times and you can think why might that have been stressful around meals at home or meals at school or do they have focus and attention issues in which case actually sitting to get through a whole meal is pretty laborious for them and hard work and we need to actually think about how we improve their focus not just how we make them eat more because if sitting is and focusing at the table is hard already then we're already starting um, with an area of difficulty. And a few other ones I'm not going to touch much on because they're much more medical, but it's important to consider how their gut function is. Have they been fed by an NG tube when they were younger? Because that can sometimes cause sensitivities later. Have they had any specific surgeries like tonsils out? That's obviously going to have cause an experience for them. Are they on medication such as for ADHD and maybe it's decreased their appetite? That's going to have caused issues. And these are issues to bring up more with your medical teams. Okay, so we've talked about the factors. Now we're going to talk about what can you do to help your child. So there's a range of different tips, again, in different categories I'd like to go through. And hopefully one or two of these will stand out um, for the child that you're thinking of in their particular situation. Okay, so some of you might have heard of the SOS approach. It is a wonderful transdisciplinary approach. So it's, there's an NDT team who are all involved in assessing and working with children. And it integrates looking at posture, sensory, motor, behavior and learning, and medical and nutritional factors. So it really looks at feeding as a whole. It's grounded and based in normal development, and that's the trajectory it follows, is how normal development for eating occurs. And what's involved is you go through a hierarchy of 32 steps to each new food. So you'll start at the bottom of these steps, and the child will work all the way up until they get to the final step, which is eating. So as I said, there are so many steps that have to be done before that food actually gets in the mouth and gets down to their tummy. The way the SOS approach runs, um, they prefer to run it in peer groups and they work on the positive social reinforcement and how that is used for children to master skills with eating. They also like you to try a range of foods at each step rather than just one food going up the ladder. So to keep trying a range of foods in each step as range drives volume. I'm sure you can imagine that once children are eating a wider range of food, it's easier to get more on their plate and more down if you're worried that they are not gaining enough weight. So as I said, there are so many steps in each category for eating. I'm going to show you a simpler diagram next. So this is exactly the same. We start at the bottom with how with children just learning to tolerate the food in their environment. So this is just to be in the same room as it. To have it in the same room, to have it on your plate, to have it on a sibling's plate, to have it in the kitchen, to have it in the house, and for them to be able to look at it. Maybe that even means to have it on their plate. The next step, once they're happy with tolerating this new food, is to interact with it. So they could just use a fork or a knife to poke it, or they could use a spoon to serve it onto a plate for someone else. So, or they could use tongs to play with it. So they're interacting with this food, but they're not necessarily touching it. They're just interacting with it. Then moves up into smelling the food. So children getting close, smelling it. You could have a conversation. How does it smell? Is it sweet? Is it sour? They don't need to do anything else other than that, but just be able to use their sense of smell and explore in that way. The next step being able to touch the food. So they could touch it with their fingers, they could touch it with their hands, they could even touch it with other parts of their body. And of course, they can touch it with their mouth or with their lips. The next stage is tasting the food. 
So maybe just licking it with the tip of their tongue or bringing the fork to their mouth and getting the tiniest taste on their tongue would be their way of tasting. Or even putting it in their mouth, taste, having a little taste and spitting it out. That is okay. I know sometimes we hate to say that it's okay to spit out, but children need to go through this phase of exploring without them feeling forced that they have to swallow it. So being able to have a taste is something that we celebrate. And then the final step is actually putting it in their mouth, chewing and swallowing it. And using this approach, which you're welcome to try at home, it def I mean, it, it's, it's always more effective if it's, if it's run by a trained therapist or a centre where they can go through all of, all of these steps and advise you on, on what you're working on or you've got a feeding consultant. But this gives you an idea of how you could introduce a new food at home and where you'd start with. So once they can tolerate it, you would think of how could we interact with it. And you'd move up, up the steps to eating until they get to the point of eating it. We celebrate at every step. So this is a little chart that I have used with um, a couple of my clients before, and it's based on the SOS approach, but it's just my, my own version, where we decide on a food together, decide on it with with the child and with the parent of whatever's the most important food we're going to try. And then they get a sticker or a tick or a bar or something as they achieve each thing. So if they can look at it, then we straight away give them a sticker or a tick. If they smell it, they get a tick. So they're getting these positive reinforcements for doing the tiniest little things. Some may be, it may be really easy for them to look at it and smell it, but at least they're getting positively reinforced for interacting with it. And then they get another one for touching it and they get another one for licking it. This example was actually with a child who was not at the point and it was too much to be going anywhere near eating. So there was no pressure on the eating. All we did was looking, smelling, touching, licking. That was it. If he wanted to put it in his mouth and if he wanted to swallow it and if he wanted to finish eating it, then great. But And we praised it, but we didn't make a fuss about it. It wasn't one of the goals in, in the chart. And it worked really well because the pressure was taken off that eating and swallowing um, element. And sometimes he would just eat it anyway, and then we'd just give him a big stick or something extra. So SOS approach or this gradual steps to eating is a way that you can think about um, introducing new food at home. Another way which is quite common, is thinking about food chaining. So food chaining is based on your child's natural preferences for what they already like, what their preferred foods are or what their safe foods are, and linking this by shape, colour or texture to a, new, to a newer food. It's really important you don't mess with their safe food. So don't go hiding food in their safe food by blending things up or hiding things in there because that will lead to a lack of trust and can lead to spit. You'll identify what a safe and acceptable, acceptable food is. Then you'll think about changing one factor. So you might change one factor of shape, colour, texture, or something a little bit different. Um, but it's one, you try and keep the sensory properties quite similar and really small changes with each one. Once they get that, then you go on to the next one. And then you go on to the next one, making a small change in each chain. You, it's likely to take multiple attempts, so don't expect them to get suddenly through the whole chain in one day or in one week. You might need to be trying that second food or the third food several times before they get there, before you then move on to the third or the fourth. There's no expectation for them, to, or there's no forcing, but praise them if they do get the next step. So here are some examples. Trying to get from bread, and we're trying to get to our de desired food of broccoli. So you start with bread. You work towards a breadstick, which is a harder texture. And you work towards a cracker. You put cheese on the cracker. You keep the cheese, but you change it to peas. So those are easier vegetables. And then you change the peas to broccoli, but you keep the cheese. And by the end, you should be on broccoli itself. And again, there's another example of how you could get from a chocolate chip cookie all the way through to blueberries by changing one factor in each each thing you might need to do way more chains in between you might need to change things in a smaller more incremental way but um feel free to have a look on the internet or the book that i just showed before if you're interested in this and find out ways that you can do this specifically for your child 
Another approach um, to use, and you could use these all together, is thinking about sense, the sensory approach. It's really important to actually think about using these all together. So even with the food chaining, um, still account for the steps to eating. So if a child won't even tolerate food in their space or won't be able to smell it or interact with it or touch it with their hands, don't be putting it in their food chain yet. So you might need to use both of those things together. Once they can tolerate, once they're at the point of almost eating it, that's when you might add on the food chain and, and chain it in there. So you might need to use all of these, all of these approaches at the same time. So in terms of sensory, just thinking about how can we make food fun? How can we make food not threatening? How can we make food not just about eating? Can we get some messy play in? So you could do normal messy play anyway, like you would with sand or rice or goo and slime and things, but you can also do food play. Think about lots of different food um, that could be incorporated where they're getting their hands in, they're getting it on their arms, they're getting it on their faces, they might put it in their mouth and that's okay. Just make sure it's obviously cooked and, and edible. You know, I think there's a picture there of, of um, un uncooked rice, so you wouldn't want that to be encouraged for eating. That would just be your um, sensory play with your hands. But if it was something like dough or instant pudding or jelly or something, then they could put that in, in their mouth. In terms of the sensory approach, you can also think about giving that deep pressure touch before they feed. So you're going to be getting into the calming tactile pathways of the brain and providing some proprioceptive input, which is regulating. So deep pressure, massage or pressing through their face, through their lips, through their gums and through their upper palate and all help to desensitize their face and their mouth which then means that they might not be so sensitive when they put food in their mouth after. And then any other fun ways that you can have a sensory fun experience with food. So printing with vegetables, playing with juice or ice, painting with fruit juice, using shape cutters, um, using toys in food that they love so that they learn to associate their favorite toy with, with, with the food that you're playing with. Exploring all the characteristics of food. When you're thinking of introducing new textures, this is the order of textures from easiest to hardest, or the order that you would go. So you might want to have a look at this if texture is a particular issue for your child. See where you think they're at and then know what to work on next. So rather than just trying all sorts of varied textures to see how we can get them eating any more food, think about let's just eat the next type of texture. So moving from liquids through a different range of purees, through soft mash food, through to food that's easily softened by saliva. So that might be food like that might be food like watsits, things like that that just soften in your mouth as you put them in your mouth. To single texture food like mini cheddars or um, pasta or crackers, to soft mixed food where you've got mixed textures in there but it's still soft, to varied foods and then onto small hard foods and that's how you would move through. Also just bear in mind that homemade food is often lumpy and it's often inconsistent. We all, every time we make it it's slightly different so it's great to work towards homemade food, but you might need to start with prepackaged food because um, that is going to be much more consistent. And your child's going to have a lot more certainty about what they're getting and you might not have the lumps, especially when you're at the puree and soft stages. Next thing to think about is their environment and their seating. So think about a quiet environment is generally better, especially for sensory children, reducing clutter so that there's less visual distractions, making sure it's not too bright, which way is the child facing? Also, are they facing into the lunch hall where there's just so many children they're feeling totally overwhelmed? Or could they be facing the wall or the window when it's a little bit less stimulating? Think about the consistency of the environment. Is it the same every time? Or are you trying to create a different environment every time with different food and there's too much change? And then in terms of seating, they need to feel 
supported and comfortable and safe. So their feet need to be able to reach the floor. Most children at home particularly will eat at an adult size um, dining room table. So it's really common that their feet won't be on the floor. So maybe something like a trip trap chair would help or putting a footstool under their feet or sitting on a cushion as well as something under their feet, finding a way to get that lovely 90-90-90 posture through their ankles, knees and hips, feet supported and get the table height somewhere between their belly button and their chest so that they're at a comfortable height. Once we have a stable body they're going to have better head control better jaw control and better dexterity over what they're eating the last um, tip i wanted to give before i go into some more general tips is thinking about the interoceptive awareness so this was this eight sensory system or the internal internal senses and if you think your child or adolescent has difficulties in this area then it could be worth look, buying this book or looking into this in more detail and actually working on how can we build their internal awareness of, um, of what's going on inside their bodies. And it could be in relation to everything, as I mentioned, in terms of heart rate, and sweating and breathing, or it could just be in relation to their food. So Kelly Marler does, has a lovely program. She has lots of training. She has lots of resources online. So feel free to look her up. And this book has some resources in it and it teaches you to do a body check or a body scan where you scan your body and you think how are my eyes feeling how's my mouth feeling is it dry is it watery is it hungry those kind of and you go through every part of your internal senses and she's got little tables that you can follow to really just learn to cue in and check and just get a bit more familiar with the internal cues of your body it will take a while, but it's worth building up these skills. For children who find, and adults who find this difficult, again, that's going to lead to your sort of over or under eating, eating too much because you don't realise, or not realising when you're hungry, and then getting to the point of being hangry or really emotional without realising that actually you are hungry. Or again, things like thirst is really important to know that they need water. Stuff in their um, mouth with food. Things like choking, gagging, fear, confusion with food, that's all linked with all of those internal senses. It's your internal, it's your proprioceptors and tactile senses in your mouth, but there's interoception mixed in there. And then lastly, I just wanted to go through a few other general key tips that might be helpful to talk about. Most importantly, when we're introducing new foods or trying to work with our picky eating child or adult or anyone, we need to go slow and steady. We need lots of exposure, lots of opportunities and taking lots of really small steps to get there. It actually takes two to three years for a typical child to learn to eat properly. Therefore, for a child who is delayed in this or has any of those factors that might affect their development or their progress through these steps, we need to allow more time than that. So just bear that in mind that we need to be patient. We need to make small changes really slowly and systematically and don't give up if something doesn't work the first time. It's important to give advance warning of meal times to children. There are occasionally some children where that's going to cause more anxiety but more often than not, having advance warning rather than just going and turning off the TV or their iPad or stopping them from playing their favourite game midway to go to a meal time that they hate already is going to cause negativity before you've even got to the table. Give them choices. Give them some control. Involve them in their eating decisions. So they can just decide between which fruits are going to be on their are going to be part of the approaches you're trying or which foods they're going to put on the menu for for your meals that week don't work on new food at every single meal they need children need to have some meals where they know it's safe they are comfortable they are relaxed and there's nothing negative attached to them so just choose your times when they are hungry but not when they're tired or not when they're stressed or not on days that are already bad days, like Fridays at the end of the week. Those would be days when you would just choose to just keep it keep it easy and not work on any new food. 
and only work on one or two new foods at a time. Don't try and do all of these strategies with five new foods in the first week because it's just going to, you're probably going to take steps backwards. Make your meals attractive. So you can think about theme based placemats and cutlery if they love a certain character or show or something. Try and see if you can get um, the cutlery or placemats or help them. They can help you to create something fun at the table so that they feel part of it. Or cut the food into fun shapes, make fun shapes like this picture on here so that it's just more of a fun experience. Try and reduce the distractions. So things like toys might be a way of getting them to the table, but then if you have to take that toy out of their hand during the meal because they're not eating, that's going to become an unnecessary argument and, again, negative experience at the table. Make a calendar for the meals, and again, the child can be involved in helping you with this. Ensure that they are comfortable at meals. Ensure they're sitting comfortably. Ensure they're in comfy clothes especially if you've got a sensory and um, sensitive child who doesn't really like their uniform and finds it a bit scratchy or doesn't like the labels, those kind of things. Don't try new foods in that uniform. Have them in their best, most comfortable clothes where they don't have tight waistbands or they don't have anything itchy so that they are as comfortable as can be before you're trying to make them do something that is going to put them out of their comfort zone. Have things like a wet or a dry cloth or both next to them so they can wipe their face give them paper towels or napkins so that if they hate something, they, can, they hate some food, they can spit it out and that's okay. And they've got a way to do that in an appropriate way that you have provided. And work towards rewards. Rewards and incentives always make the difference. So come up with some rewards of something you're working for, an event at the end of the week or an outing or working towards an activity they can do after the meal time so that they feel like it's actually really worth going through these more challenging experiences to try the new food. And then lastly, there are a few tips here on where you can find more specialist support. So Evelina has some fantastic feeding services that you can be um, referred into, especially if you have a particularly restrictive um, eating difficulty. Or you can find a therapist, which could be an OT or a speech and language therapist or pediatricians and psychologists also work in the feeding teams. And they could work individually or as a multidisciplinary team to help you with, with feeding. There are some people and places who do the SOS approach or who do feeding therapy. And this is sometimes done in individual therapy or sometimes it's done as a group. Or you might need to see a nutritional therapist or a dietitian if you're looking more at specific gut issues and nutrition issues. I've noted down a couple of books that you might want to look at for the food chaining and take a bite. And there's lots of books on the internet that you can buy that actually that will help children. And that's a lovely way to start introducing um, new food and start talk, having that conversation with your child about new food. And then there's a range of websites that you might want to go to that have some free resources. Some of them have webinars on and they might point you in the right direction. OK, so thank you for joining for that whizzed up tour of lots of broad strategies. I hope that you can take one or two things away from that. Um, I'm going to take the presentation down or the lens is going to and then we can go to any questions that you have. All right, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to just leave them in the chat box on your screen. Give you a few moments to write them in. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you so much, Nicola. Um, so if we don't have any questions at the, at this time? Is it all right if I forward you questions? Absolutely. Yes, feel free quick? to email in questions and I will get back to you. Okay, fantastic. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope it's been helpful. And thank you, Nicholas, so much for your time and energy. It's been really informative. It's a pleasure. All right. So I'll. All right.